to shelter and solidarity, a deep dive with artists and activists during this COVID pandemic. I'm your host, Joe Ramsey, live streaming and Zooming with you here from Dorchester, Massachusetts, on the south side of Boston, now almost three months into our shelter in place. Our show today, Shelter and Solidarity number eight, focuses on contingent faculty struggles and strategy in this COVID moment and beyond on campus and beyond. Late May in higher education is traditionally a time of exhaustion, but also of exhilaration, of challenges met and overcome and celebration. The long slog of grading finally finishes, students graduate, people take stock of what went well and may, what may not have gone so well and think about vacation, think about preparing for the next semester. Uh, May is an intense time, and I'm sure many of us actually who are on this show right now, I know myself, are actually still in the midst of grading, even as we broadcast to you today. All the more appreciation for those who are joining us live, despite this straining time of year. Traditionally, May in higher ed, we think of as this time of joint exhaustion and exhilaration. But for many who count themselves among the contingent faculty, the adjuncts, the non-tenure track, the appointed semester to semester, the end of one semester, the, the, the coming of late May is not just a time for celebration, as happy as we may be when the grades are in, but also a time of worry and anxiety about whether or not we'll even have work the next semester. In this particular post-COVID moment, that general state, that existing state of precarity and anxiety has been heightened and generalized considerably, almost if not universally, we are at a moment when we want to be thinking about the job we've just done, the great job we've done, when faculty across this country deserve a thank you for the incredible work they've put in to transition classes, remote and online, within a matter of days or weeks, serving students dealing with you know, unprecedented struggle and anxiety and stress, economic and health, related to both the pandemic and its economic and social fallout. And yet, in all too many cases, in a growing number of campuses and regions across the country, the contingent faculty are being hit not with a thank you, or perhaps one day with a thank you, and the next day with what some might call an F you, as they receive letters of non-reappointment, threats of layoff, um, or, un or other indications of uncertain work for the fall. The word contingency is on many a person's lips. And, in, in, and across the media, we're hearing more and more of these stories coming out. Contingencies about state funding, contingencies and worries around student enrollment, contingencies that often seem to hit first within the academic community, the contingent faculty ourselves, whatever we may be called, adjunct, non-tenured track, postdoc, visiting professors, right? Contingent faculty are being referred to in the media sometimes as the, the bellwethers, as the canaries in the coal, line, coal mine of higher education. We are joined today by contingent faculty who are not only teachers and scholars, but also organizers on campus and off. And these faculty from across the country, from Boston to New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Arizona, California, Seattle, hopefully will help us to get a report and a collective understanding of some of the struggles, some of the issues that are hitting people across this country, and the kind of responses that we are seeing from faculty, our comrades, friends, and allies. We're hoping that today have to have a discussion of not only the struggles that are ongoing and the pain that is occurring, and the, the challenges that we see, but the strategies that we both see and don't see yet for meeting and overcoming and transforming the conditions of struggle affecting 
not only contingent faculty, but the students and communities that we serve and aspire to serve, as well as our supposedly non-contingent tenure track faculty colleagues who may be themselves feeling a little more contingent these days. What are the opportunities that are implicit in this moment of challenge, right? As this, the state of contingency, the state of precarity becomes a more and more generalized condition across higher education in both public and private institutions, in institutions large and small. These and other questions, I hope you'll join us with uh, getting into a discussion today. We will have a generalized discussion starting in probably about 45 minutes after we hear from a number of invited guests and a couple of really, uh, I think, uh, insightful respondents. I'd like to start by bringing in our first three guests together in our first social, uh, kind of shelter and solidarity round table, if you will, a bit of a panel format to begin with to, to uh, create more discussion. First, we'll have Bobby Lee Smart, Bobby Lee Smart is an executive director of organizing with Adjunct Faculty United, as well as a scholar uh, of adjunct labor issues and a part-time faculty member herself from California in the community college system. Bobby Lee, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Okay, great, great. It's great to have you with us. Bobby will be joined by Wendy Marshall. Wendy is a faculty member at Temple University in Philadelphia, is active with the rank and file caucus of Temple University, a rank and file caucus of faculty there, and is active in the union of the Temple Association of University Professionals. Wendy, are you there? I'm here, happy to be here. Great, great to have you with us, Wendy. Third, and the final member of this opening panel will be Boyda Johnstone, who is active uh, with the PSC at CUNY, and also in uh, the rank and file action a group that's been doing organizing down there in New York City uh, in the CUNY system. Boyda, thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much. Great. So I thought I could, rather than addressing an individual question to each of you, kind of throw out one question and maybe in the order we just walked through introductions, um, ask you to, to kind of respond uh, and hopefully uh, start stirring up a discussion here. Uh, so the question I thought I, we could start with is just, I'd like to ask you each to kind of just locate yourselves and maybe give us a little bit of a report of what you're seeing, but also what you're feeling and what you're thinking about what you're seeing in terms of what's happening specifically to non-tenure track faculty, where you are, you know, we have at least three different campuses represented here, but also to the perhaps the broader issues and how this, what's happening to contingent faculty intersects with what may be happening to higher education in general, what may be happening to the students that we aspire to serve, right? And to other uh, communities that you, that you are connected with. Um, so I know that's a big question. We'll, we'll start with wherever you'd like to take it and then we'll break it down and redirect it. But Bobby Lee, maybe we could start with you. Could you just locate yourself for us a little bit here out in California, what you're seeing? Give us a report and maybe a reflection on, on a, kind of a first reflection on what you're seeing and hearing out in California right now. Yeah, um, so it's really interesting because the way I've been kind of saying that I feel about everything is I feel like the dude from Julius Caesar who was like, beware the Ides of March and everyone thought he was crazy, right? And everyone was like, yeah, no, whatever. And then Julius Caesar was murdered on March 15th, right? And he's like, well, I told you. And I kind of feel like that because I've been talking about this, my dissertation, which I just graduated with my doctorate, my EDD in August. So it's very fresh in my mind. My research was on part-time faculty or adjunct faculty in the community college system here in Southern California. And I kept saying that this was problematic, that this is exploitative, that we're on a tipping point. This is a breaking point. Things are going to be bad. Um, in March, as soon as I realized what was happening, I was like, this is the Great Depression mixed with the Spanish flu it's going to decimate community colleges. This is going to decimate our students. Um, I saw faculty who just didn't know how to teach online, and I'm not even talking about just part-timers. So for context, in the community college system in California, you're either part-time, adjunct, contingent, non-tenure track, or you are full-time, tenured, or tenure track. It's very, very rare that you get someone that's a full-timer that's not tenured, and usually it's like a one-year appointment. So if I if I'm saying part-time and full-time, that's what it is. My part-timers are non-tenure track and full-timers are tenure track or tenured. 
Um, and so I, I just saw it, I saw it coming. Um, and now there's massive cuts to the state. There's massive cuts to education. Um, our students are struggling with this because the faculty do not have good online pedagogy. I mean, let's be honest, lecturing at somebody for three hours straight isn't good pedagogy in the classroom, but it's really bad if you're doing it on Zoom, which is apparently what people are doing. Um, and so I kind of saw it coming because I'm very open with my students. I teach sociology courses, we talk about this. Um, so I was aware of the struggles they were dealing with in the classroom. And so um, hearing it, seeing it with that. Um, so I think that the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 situation has just kind of exploded and exacerbated something that was already at the brink. And I think it's not just higher ed, right? Obviously we're seeing it with race relations. We're seeing it with social class issues, right? We're kind of at this boiling point where things are fractured and this is only gonna get worse. Um, I think that this is our time to really be aware of as adjuncts because that's the other thing with us in the community college system is we don't have contracts. So it's not like a one year contract. We are literally semester from to semester and they make sure to always tell us that we are at will employees. So halfway through the semester, they decide they don't want you, they can fire you. You have a contract, You right? we have a bargaining contract and we have some protection, but at the end of the day, we are at will employees who are contingent on enrollment. Um, and so it's very, very precarious for us. It, it, it's hard to plan your life around this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think overall I see it, but I was on a, a higher ed, I think it was Chronicles of Higher Ed did a webinar about this a couple of weeks ago about contingent faculty, part-time faculty in the system. And one guy said, and I was glad to hear a full-timer say it, he said, don't think that, that tenure is on its way out or that this is a threat to tenure. If only 25% of faculty in the, you know, in the country are tenured or tenure track, you're already under track attack. Tenure already doesn't exist. It's already under threat if less than a quarter of faculty are tenured or tenure track faculty. And I think that that's really come to a boiling point that we need to be aware of. And we need to take this moment to really push for a reinvestment of higher ed and to pull away from this privatization and corporatization of higher ed and move back to it being a public good, if that's where we wanna go. We need to really point out, while you have no money for faculty right now, you're still somehow hiring administrators. You're still creating new positions for administrators, right? But you're not having money for faculty. You can't pay us. You want to furlough us. You're going to cut our classes. You're going to increase our class sizes. I think all of that is stuff faculty needs to be very, very careful of and aware of in how we move forward. And we need to make our students aware of it. I think once you make students aware of it, you gain them as allies. They're the ones who are paying for this. Um, that's when you can start the movement. So I think I think I addressed everything, but if you, that's a, you know. That's a great opening comment. I, I really like the way you laid it out uh, to start with Bobby Lee and we'll, and we can dig into a lot of the specific issues as we go with the next, over the next hour. Uh, Wendy, could you pick up from there? Wendy, um, I, I would love for you to address anything that you just heard Bobby Lee say, but also just give us a sense of your kind of read, uh, not only limited to Temple, but if you want to speak more broadly about what you see happening and what you kind of, what are your kind of thoughts and initial reflections on what you're seeing happening and how the contingent struggle of faculty relates to perhaps other issues of concern as well. Take it away, Wendy. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with Bobby Lee that the pandemic coupled with the second Great Depression um, and that we are merely on the edge of, have not experienced in full blast at all, um, is going to um, strain us and harm us and kill us. Um, yeah, so I agree that, and I think that people aren't really, you know, you read mainstream um, bourgeois liberal media in the New York Times, and there's a great deal of denial about what's going on and um, how many people are suffering. Um, I think that, I think the first thing I want to just say is that to be clear, adjuncts are in market terms, flexible labor which means that we are hired when there's a need and we are let go when that need doesn't exist. Um, and no contract that I'm aware of in the labor struggles of adjuncts has been able to take that down because to take that down challenges the fundamentals of the neoliberal university and the way that, that it is set up. So um, there is no question that adjuncts are losing their job. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be losing our jobs. Um, I also wanna say, that we're not the only low wage workers on campus who are gonna lose our jobs. Um, people who work in maintenance and security and food services and who run dorms and all that, all those jobs, many of those jobs are gonna be wiped out. So 
um, I think a very, very important direction for us to be moving in is thinking beyond ourselves as educators, thinking of ourselves in as workers um, in coalition with other low wage workers on campus. Um, so I think that uh, I also want to say that if you ask me what the current situation on campus is, I have to say that I, I'm, I struggle to be committed to the fight of adjuncts, although I'm an adjunct, I'm part of RAF caucus and part of TAUP, um, because to be frank, higher education itself is completely fucked up. It is a monument to racial capitalism and white supremacy. Um, it does not um, adequately teach anybody, young people or anybody else. Um, it suppresses critical thinking and diverse views. And so I want to be clear what it is we're fighting for when we're fighting for, um, when, we're, when we're engaged in a struggle in higher education. Um, I, I just wanted to give a quick quote. Um, thank you, Bobby Lee. I, I just wanted to give a quick quote from George Jackson, who was an author, a theorist and revolutionary. Um, and he said, the argument that the prestige of power will let itself be educated away is too idiotic to be allowed to stand. And I think that's important because I think we have to ask, what the fuck are we doing in higher education? What are we teaching? What is it adding up to? What is the point? It no longer is a ticket to the middle class. Students graduate with student debt and move out to low wage jobs unless they go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Stanford. The rest of us are not going to get any ticket to any class mobility um, and are being trained to think in ways that don't threaten power, um, that don't help students understand themselves as workers. Um, and I also am very concerned about the lily whiteness of the academy and the fact that black faculty have um, the proportion, the percentage of black faculty has increased at all. Um, if you take out the faculty that work at historically black colleges and universities, it's some minuscule 4%. Um, and that is, I think, a clear indication of um, the limits of the current university and college and education system. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of stuff that I'm worried about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you make a, a crucial reminder for us all, Wendy, that there is no right kind of golden age to return to. Right. It's like that there's a danger that the struggle for improving faculty conditions just kind of posits, uh, you know, a kind of nostalgic desire to go back to, a, a you know, a, a golden day that really never existed or certainly did not exist for, for most people. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's a crucial element here. And I hope we can dig more into that about how how the current crisis can actually feed uh, or open up opportunities for organizing and thinking that pushes beyond that kind of nostalgic uh, reformist kind of mode here. Uh, even as there may be things we really do want to defend at the same time, inside and outside the, the university gates. Boyd, I think that's a good note to bring you in, right? Someone who's working at, at CUNY. Um, and I understand you you actually yourself, um, no shame in this, uh, have actually uh, you're now on the tenure track side, having been a non-tenure track faculty and activists, but now working with a with an adjunct, uh, um, I should say, and uh, a kind of cross tier organizing with the rank and file um, uh, association. So, give us could you give us the read from CUNY, uh, as well as what your senses of what higher ed is facing overall as it relates to these contingent faculty issues and beyond. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks so much for having me here today. It is true what you say, Joe, that I am, in fact, um, not an adjunct. And um, so I'm a tenure track faculty member in the English department at the Community College, uh, Borough of Manhattan Community College, part of the CUNY system in New York. Um, and I previously I was involved with um, the contingent workers union at Fordham University, which actually got a really good contract um, in 2017. And it was really exciting for me to, you know, well, for many, many reasons, like basically winning the lottery and the getting the golden ticket of this job that like every single day I, I kind of like praise the heavens and and wonder how I got here. Um, but it was really exciting for me to come from Fordham and hear immediately in the PSD union, um, people talking um, in 
you know, high giving high praise to the Fordham contract that like maybe this is going to be something that was starting to like overturn um, the wide sweat widespread problem of adjunctification that is like consuming the university as uh, the previous speakers have already talked about and everyone here knows. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just say that like when I first started at CUNY, I thought, okay, this is great. We have this super strong union that's going to fight for our interests. And um, the PSC CUNY was, I thought that, you know, previously at Fordham, I was trying to help ad, uh, unionize, first of all, the graduate workers there because I did my PhD at Fordham. Um, and there was a lot of union suppression and it ultimately didn't work out because of the successive rulings by the NLRB. First, we thought for a minute that, okay, private union unions would be able to unionize grad workers and then of course Trump came into power and that um, decision was overturned just a few months ago in September 2019. So anyway I was excited to be part of this very strong union and um, I think I've since <laughs> learned some of the error of my some of my naivete coming in um, in the two, two short years that I've been at CUNY um, and so I think that the challenge is I mean, much of what I have to say, as Bobby Lee was saying before, like these problems were present before COVID. It's just that we've now reached a breaking point, something that we all knew was coming. And so the, the challenges that I've experienced as an activist and a labor organizer in the CUNY system, I think the first challenge would be my colleagues in the full-time tenure track um, line, who I think Wendy put it really well that we can't, the um, university system does not train us to think in ways that fight against power. And there is just this like very insidious um, sense of complacency within a lot of like people I consider my good friends. Um, and, and a lot of it is because some of them have had been adjuncts for like 20 years and then they finally got the job that they've been working for. And like, you know, so they feel like they did their time. Um, but it's, and it's really unfortunate for me, but to, to sort of see that, and I'm, I'm very much right now in the head of like, cause we just came off, um, the rank and file action group has, is mostly adjuncts, but it's definitely like the union is cross title. Uh, that's both one of its strengths and one of its major problems. The union is mostly run by full timers. Almost everyone in the delegate, almost all the PSC delegates are full timers. And um, the, the uh, committee for adjuncts and part timers or CAP, which is supposed to be representing adjunct in interest within the union, just has very little decision making power at all. So we have just come against up against so many roadblocks to try to have for last semester, we had um, a contract that we fought really hard. I have the poster here behind me. We fought really hard to have um, a, a no vote passed on this contract. Um, and, you know, Wendy also mentioned the bourgeois liberal media. This was a major problem for us. They're like the PSC leadership is absolutely, um, you know, bedfellows with um, a lot of the liberal media that was touting how amazing this contract was, that it was transformative to adjuncts. But we really knew that this was not the case that we still adjuncts on the on the whole receive $4,200 a course, which would be, you know, $25,000 for an entire year if you teach three classes per semester. So still half of what I receive as a full timer, which, I'm, you know, in New York City is not going to get you very far. So we lost the no vote. Um, and um, we have so and then the union has kind of a democracy problem that we've been finding we just have a really hard time getting letting our voices be heard even I, I think i'm just very much in the head of this campaign that we've just come off of which was to try to fight we had um some campuses at cuny have been asked to make 25 percent cuts to their budgets preemptive um in advance of the budget that that hasn't even been announced yet. And we have all this federal funding from the CARES Act. So for a while, it looks like things might be different now, um, but there were almost 450 adjuncts at John Jay College who were laid off. Um, and so we had tried to push forward this grade withholding 
um, campaign to um, maybe potentially move towards a wild wildcat strike. But um, this is what has been we've been building up for, towards today. And it turns out, we, I mean, I think we gained a lot of momentum, but we won't be withholding our grades beyond the deadline. So it won't actually become a strike. Um, and then finally, I guess I'm, I'm sort of circling through like the challenges would be like trying to get full timers to care about adjuncts, which I can talk more about later. I'm trying to make that union care about adjuncts. And then thirdly, and this one is always so much easier is making the students care about adjuncts. They do care about adjuncts. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of deception and and kind of misinformation circulated about the fact that students will will totally be our allies in this struggle that's what just in the last few weeks we were told even by the psc that like oh you're throwing students under the bus by withholding your grades i was told that um by people on social media people in my department um really to justify their own inaction um, and, and unwillingness to stand up for the adjunct crisis. And so, but when I talk to my students who, as I'm sure many of you know, like some almost 50% of CUNY students have experienced food or, in, or housing insecurity, that it, according to a report that was released in 2019, like an astonishing and really upsetting, devastating number of my students have had family members extremely sick or literally die due to the COVID crisis. They've been um, working on their distance learning classes in cramped conditions in their apartments um, and dealing with, you know, the crisis is hitting them directly. And when I talk to them about how the fact that some of 60% of their professors might be losing our adjuncts and then that their jobs are in crisis, um, the students absolutely step up. So that's the third um, challenge making students care is really the easiest of the, all of them and the one that really keeps me going. Yeah, it's picking up on that, that note, I mean, a, a number of things you said, but I think one thing to think about, right, you, you bring in the class and race and the vulnerability of many of our struggling working class students, right, at, at public institutions. I was doing a little reading and prep for the show, actually, just uh, kind of in an uncanny way. In March 2020, uh, just before COVID was really hitting here uh, in a big way, before campuses were closing, the New York Review of Books did an essay. I don't know if people saw it, a review essay of like 15 books that have been read, written about like adjunct higher ed and inequality. And one of the stats that I pulled from there, well, I mean, one was kind of an empowering one. We have 1 million contingent faculty in this country right now. Another one, but then you break that down, about 50% of the faculty at PhD granting public, larger public institutions are contingent, right? Still roughly a majority, depending on how you count. But at community colleges, and maybe Bobby Lee can bring this back to you in a moment, it's 83%. Right. So in other words, at the higher ed institutions, right, which which serve mainly almost exclusively working class, disproportionately black and brown, right, historically oppressed and marginalized people and non-traditional students. Right. People, uh, you know, single mothers struggling to get back in the workforce. Right. And, and so forth. And, you know, folks that, uh, dealing with other kinds of constraints. Right. These are the places that have the highest rate of contingency, the, the lowest level of, of job security, right? So I think it seems to be one way to open up the relationship between right, how class and race, um, you know, inequality among our students and communities intersects with higher ed struggles is to actually bring out this fact that it's just so it happens to be, right, that the most working class and, and exploited and oppressed communities are also not given the, the luxury of faculty that have Job, job security, right? That, uh, you know, at, at elite institutions like Princeton and Harvard, there still are contingent workers and grad students, and I'm not trying to make a binary here, but, right, it perhaps even in the time of pandemic, the, you know, the millionaires and billionaires' kids aren't going to be worrying too much about not getting quality higher ed, even though online might be a challenge, right? But it's specifically working class and racialized communities that are that are disproportionately affected by higher ed cuts in general funding and the issue of contingency in, uh, in particular. I mean, um, Bobby Lee and Wendy, I'd love to get your kind of response to that. And also maybe the response to another thing that a couple of you have raised uh, and certainly um, uh, certainly Boyd had just raised it, about the relationship to students, right? The relationship to students and the potential relationship to students, right? The relationship to students, which I think can, right, be sometimes played, can become a contradiction. People feel like they can't tell the students about things because that's unprofessional, right? But as a number of you have already alluded to, letting the students in can actually be very empowering. 
So I'd love to hear, um, you know, on either of those fronts, uh, Bobby Lee, maybe you could jump in and then, and then Wendy, um, and perhaps we can, uh, you know, and then come back to Boyda. Okay. Um, if I go off, like someone just bring me back, like rein me in. Um, but I'm going to start with, um, with what Wendy said. I had typed in the chat box that she was my hero, really calling it out for the racism, the classism, the sexism that is still going on in higher ed. And I said it in my dissertation that, um, and it was something that came through, it's something in the research on adjunct faculty, is that while with these institutions is that while we sit here and we hear all the time that colleges and universities are these liberal institutions and we're brainwashing students, they're not. As Wendy said, they are neoliberal institutions that are maintaining the status quo. They want diversity in look, but not diversity in thought. They want to be able to check the box that they've got, you know, faculty of color, students of color, they've got women, they've got LGBTQ folks, they've got diversity of religion, but they want you to think like them. They don't want you to challenge them. They want to maintain what's happening, right? Um, I think Boyda, you said something about they don't actually teach us to fight back, right? They don't teach us to challenge them. And so they want you, what is the George Carlin thing? They want you smart enough to follow directions, but not smart enough to challenge them, right? And so it's that same And smart thing enough to fill out the paperwork. Yes, right. right and fill that, out that's process. important. <laughs> and so, so we have that kind of going on in these institutions and there's a revolving door of faculty of color in the full-time positions, right? They'll, they can always say they have their X amount of full-timers, but you don't realize that they're always leaving and being replaced with a new person of color constantly, right? Like they're, it's like, okay, this is maybe not the best example, but we were watching America's Got Talent this afternoon. Like we recorded it, we were watching and my brother's like, what happened to the girl that was there before, right? And it was, I think her name was Alicia. And he was like, is this what they do? They just have a new random judge. But I was like, why is the new random judge always the woman of color? First, it was Mel B. Then it was Gabrielle Union. Then it was Alicia. And now it's um, Sofia Vergara, right? So so that that way that we are always replacing a person of color, but yet we always have one, right? Or we always have a person. Um, I think that that's a problem. And also I was reading, I can't remember what I was reading. I've read so many articles recently about this where, um, you know, your diversity of your faculty is your adjuncts. If you get, right, like if you get rid of us, you don't have diversity. You don't have that anymore. And, and so, so there is, so that's my thoughts on like the diversity question, right? And what's going on there, but then bringing it back to students. Again, I teach sociology. So the second you get to get into the education system or you get into social class and I look at them and I explain to them that I have a master's degree or I have a doctorate and I'm a college professor, but not a real college professor, I'm an adjunct, right? And I don't have healthcare and I couldn't move out until very recently because I couldn't afford to pay rent by myself and that I could never pay off my student loans. And like, they were like, what? how how does that work how, how wait i don't understand and then you start explaining to them the reality of this right through through the lens of class right like through our class content that we're talking about and they're like wait where's my money going i'm like i don't know why don't you ask you know the president of the college who gets a car allowance or the president of the university you're transferring to who gets a housing allowance and a car allowance and his kid gets to go to school for free how about you and they're like i'm sorry what 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 what's happening who gets what now how is this working, right? And so once you start to exploit that and you show them what is happening, they get really angry really quick and they are willing. I've had my students straight up tell the college professor, um, my professor deserves a raise. Why isn't she full-time? She's the best, he like, they will go in on him like when they have that opportunity, once they understand what's happening, right? But if they don't understand what's happening, because we're so embarrassed of it, there's a lot of shame in being part-time and not being full-time tenure track. People don't want to talk about it, right? But once your students have that knowledge, they will have your back because they understand now what this means for them. Why should I go to college if you went, you got all this debt, you got all these degrees and you can't make it, right? Like, what are we doing? Right. So I think that there there is a lot of that for students once they're aware of what's happening because they're paying full tuition, whether they get me or someone else. And with me, there's no guarantee I'm here next semester. There's no guarantee for that letter of rec. I don't have to have office hours. I'm oh, so where's your student success? How can these schools say they're dedicated to students when this is how they're treating 70% um, of their faculty? Right. Like that's not student success. So once the students understand that that's your power. And they can vote these people in and out at the community college because they're the board of trustees, right? They can vote people out of office. They can show up. That's when you get the district scared. That's when you get the schools to pay attention. And so that's mm -hmm. been my experience. When we've, when we've had actions, our students have come to speak because they understand it. 
Yeah, Bobby Lee, I think what you're saying is really inspiring. And I think, I mean, a key point you make, you made a number of key points, but one is that, you know, students w are capable and, and even eager to be this kind of powerful, you know, energizing force once they're let in, right? And then all, you know, and sometimes they may need some help doing that because these, unfortunately, this is not common knowledge, though maybe the story is getting out a little more these days than it did five or 10 years ago, as more people are writing about it and talking about it, right? Uh, but I think that's that's really that's really crucial, um, and I, I think uh, it's a great transition back to Wendy. I know Wendy, you've you've been involved in community organizing on and off campus, which I, I'm sure has involved students and maybe non-students as well. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to the student question, uh, Wendy. Uh, obviously, the race and class inequity question has has been addressed in different ways, and also perhaps bring in the, the issue of even non-students or not yet students and the broader community. I know something that's been very acutely uh, experienced and felt at Temple. Uh, maybe you could you could draw us into that a little bit, Wendy. Um, okay, yeah. So first, I want to say that um, Bobby Lee, I don't agree that adjuncts are the diversity because there are very few adjuncts of color, just as there are very few other faculty of color across the ranks. So if you wiped out all the adjuncts, there'd still be hardly any people of color rolling around in the university. Although I think maybe adjuncts are predominantly female. Not sure. Um, I want to say that, um, that, so first of all, at Temple, which in the 80s, Temple was practically, Temple felt very much like a Black university. Um, black enrollment was like 25% back in the day. Um, but it's been gentrified, and now enrollment is more like 12% of Black students, and less and less students that come from around, come from North Central, which is a historic Black um, uh, neighborhood in Philadelphia. Um, I also want to say that there's a lot of stagecraft that goes into producing what counts as students. Um, like Boyd mentioned and Bobby Lee, many of my students at Temple are struggling. And every, every semester, at least a, a few students come out to me as um, food insecure and hungry. Um, I always ask to find out how many people are working and how many hours they're working. And most people are working and some people are working 35 and 40 hours a week and still trying to go to the undergraduates and get jobs. So the whole reality of what the, the I mean, outside of the most elite campuses where like in at the most elite campuses, the majority of students come from the 1%, but that's not true of any of us represented on this call. Um, and that means that students are really struggling, but there's all this stage crafting that goes in. So students want to wear temple hats and temple uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts. And there's this whole um, kind of industry to promote the idea that it means something that you go to this school and that you're going to get somewhere when really what you're getting is your, your future earnings are being colonized by student loan debt. Um, and you're, you're graduating into an economy that's going to give you some kind of low wage job. Um, I agree that students are allies sometimes, um, but I think it's a struggle. I think students also have a lot to learn about class. There's a great, a great deal of denial about class among all my students across race. Um, and so I think it's really important to try to organize. Um, I, I was part of a, a group called Stadium Stompers which was a community um, student coalition that um, has to, to, to date gotten the university to stand down from building a stadium in North Central. Um, North Philadelphia residents were absolutely opposed and we were able to recruit students. Um, so it was this really powerful coalition of Temple students and North Central residents um, the union, TAUP, was very, very supportive. Um, few faculty were, were part of that struggle, but it, it was definitely a model of, of what can be accomplished when different kinds of people get together. I liked it a lot because it was both Black-led um, and generational, um, and that was very powerful. Picking up on that, Wendy, I mean, you mentioned um when we talked prior to this uh, show about your concern about the, the the university as a gentrifying force itself right and the the yeah. struggle of the stadium stompers to stop that development project i was something you mentioned i had heard about already actually from from other past organizing uh, contacts but it also you also mentioned that you were concerned about the gentrification of enrollment itself right yeah. um in, in the way in which these already pronounced trends of the kind of you know uh the the white you know lily whitening as you pointed out right um 
the, the white uh, the whitening of the campus may be exacerbated by these trends as, as people that maybe previously could at least struggle and afford campus, at least for a few semesters, are, are kind of pushed out. Would you like to say more about, about that? Uh, that in particular, is this something that you see or that others who are on the, on the call see this as a danger? Like, how are our students going to be, and even right now, I mean, we've mentioned they're struggling. How is this going to affect the student how are the student body uh, that we ex that we experience in the fall going to be different than the one that we we had back in January? Do you want to speak to that, Wendy, before we go back to Boyda? Yeah, real quick, <clears throat> I'll just say that it speaks to the degradation, the unviability of um, higher education institutions. Because <clears throat> I know this is true of CUNY, it's true of Temple. I'm not so hip to what goes on in California, but I'm pretty sure it's true there that higher education institutions. Um, gentrify neighbors because dorms, campus living has been privatized, so nobody lives on campus anymore, and huge development springs up, which means that people are displaced, long-term residents, who, people who've lived in North Central for generations are displaced. And I know that's true because, by the way, I am a graduate of CUNY. I, I'm a graduate of the CUNY BA pro program, Hunter College, 1985, um, and lived in Washington Heights and Harlem, and now can hardly recognize um, can hardly recognize CUNY, um, CCNY in particular. Um, so I think that's another part that we need to think about. We, we need to fight for institutions that support working class values and working class life. Um, and I'm not with the fight. It's just going back to us being contingent, flexible labor and lily white institutions. Yeah, thank you for that, Wendy. Uh, I wanna go to Boyda. Uh, we actually got a question off of Facebook Live, someone who's not on the call, but actually a, a colleague and fellow organizer I know from UMass Boston, a longtime non-tenure track faculty um, advocate and, and unionist, um, Amy Todd, who had a question for you, uh, Boyda, which is as someone who has, as you, as you put it, I think appropriately got the, struck the golden ticket of a tenure track gig, right? At, you know, let alone at some place you actually you know, wanted to live, if you can afford to live there, right? What, I mean, Amy, send you props, you know, for continuing to con fight on this, you know, be involved in this struggle. What do you think, uh, you know, um, d has allowed you to do that in ways that other tenure track faculty can't? If somebody could uh, mute their microphone, please. Mute your microphone if you're not speaking, we're getting some reverb, thank you. Uh, Boyda, you know, why do you continue to work in solidarity with principally non-tenure track faculty uh, around these issues of campus and, and community equity and justice? And why do you think other, what holds back more tenure track folks from being on the line in the way that you you are right now? Like, you know, I mean, obviously there's every institutional incentive in the world to kind of turn your back, right, on, uh, on non-tenure track faculty once you get led into a club, at least from one standpoint, right? Associating with the riffraff may not be good for your own, you know, tenure application, depending on who's sitting on the committee, not to scare, you know. But so why, why have you stuck it out? And why do you think, um, more tenure track folks don't, or let me put it optimistically, haven't yet. Uh, well, I, I certainly hope that the yet is the key um, word there, uh, because I do, I, I, I'm optimistic, um, I think about the future. Unfortunately, that might just be because the crisis is so bad that First of all, like tenure, as someone mentioned earlier, I don't think our jobs are that secure right now. I think that it, it's possible that unemployment might make it to as high as 40%. And, you know, the country is going to completely crash financially. So those of us who don't have tenure yet, I mean, first of all, so maybe that isn't exactly the place to start with that question, but I do think that there are selfish reasons um, why full timers should be standing up for in solidarity with um, adjuncts and, and defending them and also just really advocating for more full-time positions being opened up and paths to full-time so that you aren't just stuck in this contingent um, poverty wage gig, you know, forever. So I think that I, I like you, we do in my Rafa group, we do have to kind of start to resort to the argument that like in a year or two, Two is going to be our jobs on the line if they start to if adjuncts right now are on the chopping block you know it's us next um but personally also I, I have to say that it's not entirely altruistic 
um, for other reasons as well. I'm married to an adjunct um, in the CUNY system and um, his job is very much in danger right now too. And so I, I obviously I have like a personal investment um, in that sense. And um, also I just think like, institutionally and structurally it's so easy um as you said joe to like turn your back on adjuncts but um even in a geo even in like a physical sense like the way that our offices are set up on campus and the way that adjunct life makes it so possible you just kind of like shuttle in and out you don't you have a crowded office space with like hundreds of other adjuncts and um so of course you're not gonna like just hang around in the faculty lounge i think that um, the, it really serves the system well that adjuncts um, are so uh, ephemeral and and really don't aren't able to make a lot of intentional connections and feel like part of the communities on campus. So for me, like coming from Fordham and the work I did there, and I, I was immediately introduced to a lot of the organizers at CUNY, like I had friends who were adjuncts and I, I've, I've really been in, try, intentional in reaching out to adjuncts and like building, you know, we've been holding like Zoom happy hours and town halls and trying to like reach out and hear more people's stories. And then um, the more you talk to them, the more you like construct these communities and these networks, the more you realize that like, there's no, absolutely, there are no differences between us. There's no reason for us to just like continue on our merry way, paying attention to our research, like it's the only thing that matters. So I really think it's about community um, in addition to just a general sense of wanting to fight for justice. Um, and it is also about the state and the health of higher education as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would agree with you that there is a there is a potential anyway, unity of interest between most non tenure track and most tenure track faculty. Right. What are tenure track faculties complaints a lot of the time? Right. Too much overwhelming service load, not enough time to do research. Right. Well, maybe if there if you could double the number of tenure track tenured protected included faculty. Uh, right by including your your teaching force as actually having some say over you know faculty governance and in departmental service right you, you could actually thin out that load too right i mean i mean work right when some people's jobs are cut the workload's going to spill onto someone else right so there's certainly and yet at the same time there are cultural social stigmas right wrapped up with the whole ideology of meritocracy that a lot of people even on the left i think have internalized Right. I mean, you you put it as a golden ticket, but like a lot of people wouldn't put it as such a contingent thing. Right. I earned this. Right. It's, I'm special. I deserve this more than others. And, you know, I, I, you see it even in people that maybe share nine out of 10 political views with you sometimes that they, you know, they don't want to invite you to the party. You know, right. There's still a kind of social separation there. Uh, so, I mean, I think you, you hit on a number of important issues. I want to ask one more question, and it's an impossible question, um, because I want to ask you to be brief on it before we bring in at least two or three more voices to the conversation, our respondents that have, uh, so, that, you know, for uh, Benedict and, uh, and John and our Arizona team. Um, but I want to ask you uh, something that you've all kind of hit on a little bit, like, what is, uh, what is a, you know, a, uh, I'll put it as a, as a take, pick one or the other, or maybe both. Right. What do you see as a major danger right now? Not just a danger of like, you know, COVID killing people and all this stuff, but a danger for our movement, right? Or danger for the movement of people, at least who think they're, you know, on the side of fighting for justice or to protect the university. What's a, what's a danger zone that you think people either are, we may be falling into even as we speak. And, and then, and then what do you think is a, is, is a, is an action or, or a framework, you know, what's, a, what's, what's something that should be done right now? Something that you'd like to see happen? I mean, uh, Wendy, you mentioned it in, in, a bro in broad strokes in terms of fighting for working class values and consciousness and institutions that forward working class life. I wonder if you, you know, maybe even, we could start with you here, maybe if you're ready to, to kind of break that down a little, what would that, what does that look like concretely, right? Uh, you know, I know it's a, that's a big question. You can take one side of that or, or, or both, but I'd love to hear you, like kind of a danger and an opportunity. And then I know I know Ben is ready to speak to this too. So maybe after we hear from the panel, Ben, we could bring you in, and then John, who is full of in interesting thoughts on this, can can jump in too. Wendy, would you like to go first, or I would. I would like to go first. Great. So one of the dangers, one of the major dangers for our movement, is the current union leadership and union structures that we are um, that we must endure until we change them. So we have unions like the AFT, which are run on a business model, which um, 
which privilege and center the lives of tenured and tenure track faculty, which never intended to really mount a fight for adjuncts because that would upend the entire basis of a union where the union president makes $400,000 a year. Um, so I think that's a really, really big problem. And that's why I'm a member of Raft Caucus. That's why I'm thrilled to be here with Voida and Bobby Lee, people who are, are taking rank and file action to figure out how we can fight to transform universities to the things that we need, right? In a world that values us as human beings, human development. Um, so that's, I think that is the pressing danger for if, if we're talking about a movement of adjuncts, that is most definitely a pressing danger. And I, if I could also just add, even though I might get myself in trouble, that uh, meritocracy is a myth. And I know fewer people who are dumb than those who have PhDs. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Bobby Lee, you want to go? You go next, and then we'll go to Boyda, and then we'll bring in Ben and John. Yeah. Um, so this fittingly is Loki, my cat that's joined us with the god of mischief over here. Um, and so I think that one of the huge dangers that we have um, is what Wendy talks about is this you know, letting things come back together um, as the way that it was, not actually changing the system, not actually taking this as an opportunity to make things better. Um, and to really delve into that, right? I think that the danger that we're in is that adjuncts who speak out are going to get cut. There is no protection really for adjuncts. So it's going to be a huge issue. I think that that's a big danger. I know we're dealing with that right now um, with one my, with the local that I'm in is that they don't have a seniority rights article. So California has a law where you have a rehire rights preference and it's to get people maxed out in the amount of units they teach because we do have um, a cap on how much we can teach every semester in each district. And so trying to move that way, well, the district I'm in or you know, where I'm the executive director, they don't have that protection. And I realize they're holding out on negotiating with this you know, because we're negotiating right now, they're holding out on it because they want to make sure that they weed out everyone they don't like before they put this into place. Because now is their moment. This this moment of not having enough money, right, it, to do that work. Um, so I think that that is one of the biggest dangers that we have. But I think that if people come together, if people start talking about this, if we involve our students, if we involve our friends and family, if we get the word out, we can press the states, we can press our districts to really restructure higher education in a much better way. And I think Wendy's right, like just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're great at your job. It doesn't mean you're the smartest person in the room. Um, and I think that, that some of that also needs to be reevaluated. I won't say my real thoughts on what's happened with tenure. Um, and the bastardization of it. Um, but I think that there is some reevaluation that should probably happen there as well. Um, just just gonna put that out there. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear your your full thoughts. Perhaps we'll circle circle around again, Bobby Lee. But at one point you want to you made I want to I want to echo and, and raise up is also the I, I think in a way connecting also what, what what Wendy said about the need to transform universities, not just fight for restoring them, right? But it almost seems to me we're never going to get that public funding that we need if, if we can't really convince critical majorities of the public that higher ed is really meeting the needs of working class people. Right, not to say that there still won't be resistance, bourgeois resistance even then, right? But I mean, to the extent that that even public institutions, nominally public institutions, have accepted the idea, right, of marketing themselves as like the main reason to come to college is because you can get a bump in income, right? Right? It, relative to people that don't go to college, right? To the extent that, you know, the value of higher ed is being marketed by its exclusivity, by its by its class, you know, step up the ladder. You know, right to that extent, like there's a huge alienation that runs through even higher ed advocates who are they claim to be fighting for equity, but they're actually fighting and framing their arguments in terms that often reinforce kind of notions of class inequality, as opposed to really trying to make an argument for education as a matter of the as a public right, as the common good or something along those lines, let alone, you know, working class consciousness is as, as empowering to, you know, to bring about a, a world fit for human beings. 
right? So I mean, there's like, I mean, a real, I guess my point is here, isn't privatization like inside, it's not just out there in the sense of funding, but it's almost like neoliberalism privatizations also in people's heads and how we talk mm -hmm. and how we, and, and shedding that might be, you know, part of what the challenge is concretely, how do we do that? You know, it's a longer conversation, but um, yeah. can we go to, you wanna to respond to that, uh, Bobby Lee, and then we'll go to, and then we'll go to Boyda? Yeah, um, Wendy said something when she was first talking about like the unions and how we always default to full-time faculty and they do. We are 70% of the faculty and yet the thought process is always on the full-timers, right? It's always on what are their needs? How do we address their needs? And like kind of pitting it against each other, right? And and we're, we're supposed to be invisible. We're not supposed to be seen. So I think that that's a huge, huge part of it. Um, I had another thought and it left me. Um, but what did you just, Joe, you asked me something very specific and I had an answer and then it like went I mean, out. I, said, the, I mean, I guess the, the point I was flagging was about how to what degree privatization and neoliberal ways oh. of thought are actually yes. not just out there like, oh, they won't give us funding, but in here and how we've been taught to think about our own institutions and how we are in some sense alienated from our own you know, interests by that ideology. Yeah. And, and then the, how, then the question of, I guess the question was, how can we concretely start to shed that in different ways? What are the, what are the practices right. and the modes we could take on or, or, or stop using that could help us, right? right. To but, make progress and shedding yeah. some of that baggage. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it is because, I, so my doctorate, I chose the program I chose. I chose to get my EDD at Cal State LA. Um, that is where I've graduated with my doctoral degree in education. And it was a social justice program. I want to be clear that I chose this program because it was sold as a social justice and educational reform program. And I was so excited. And then I had a bunch of freaking college, you know, administrators teaching my classes. I had a bunch of people telling us about how this is just the way it is. And, you know, students have to struggle and it's the grind who makes you who you are. Mm -hmm. And I would sit in classes with administrators and go, okay, so this is a social justice program and we're supposed to be reforming education. And, you know, yes, the grind might have made you who you are and that's fine, but our job is to make this better for other people so they don't go through the shit that we went through. And then they would all just stare at me. And these were administrators of that college, right, of Cal State LA. These were former community college presidents. Um, these were current community college administrators. And I just, I always was calling it out because they do, they believe it. And then I would have classmates who are getting this degree in social justice saying things like, well, you know, we're the students and we're paying for a service and we're the clients. And so you have to teach me what I want to learn. No, 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 no. You don't know what you need to learn. Like, can you imagine the audacity of one of our students telling us that we need to, like, I want to learn this and that's what you're going to teach me. You don't know what you need to learn. I'm the one that has the degree and the experience and the education in the background to help you with this and you know things. And I don't wanna say that students don't know things, right? Because I do value my students. My classes are all very discussion-based and they have experiences, but we help them shape that, right? We help them to come to terms with these words and these ideas and bring them new knowledge. But the idea that they're clients and that we owe them something, that they bought this grade. I mean, this is the devaluing of higher education. And to just pass students along can you imagine having someone who got a degree in social justice going out and talking about students or our clients and we have to sell them something? I mean, I would be, Absolutely. I know, like, God, don't tell anyone you got a degree from the same institution as me, right? Yeah. And we're doing that to our students if we're allowing them and yet to graduate the with BAs with no knowledge. That devalues us. That that completely erodes our purpose if we're saying that they learn something and then they're walking out knowing nothing. Sorry, that was my soapbox. I like, and right, absolutely. I'm no, sorry. no, and and of course, it doesn't start with the student in the sense. It's not just it's not just this uh, client mentality or whatever is not this customer mentality is not just ideology. It's also objectively built into the structure when they get that tuition bill, right? It, when a public education costs fifteen thousand dollars a year in state, in a lot of places, right? At UMass Boston, where I where I teach right, for in-state students, right, they are objectively being, as we say, you know, interpolated, right, hailed into thinking about this as a purchase, right? So it's like, I mean, it'd be very different, I think, if, if, if we got it back to being next to free, like when UMass Boston is right behind me, uh, about a mile away, um, opened up in 1964, 65, was 100 bucks a semester, which I think, I want every student who comes to my classroom to know at least that and then have some idea of what changed. 
Um, I can go off on this too, but I'm the host. So let me take a step back. Uh, Boyd, I'd like to get your thought on a danger and or an opportunity for, um, for in this moment. I know we've spoken to some already. I know you've, there was a, a great strike. I mean, one way to think about this is also what are the leverage points that we do have now? And then I'd like to bring in Ben and John and our Arizona team um, to, uh, to, to broaden out the discussion. Okay, thanks. I have so many thoughts um, about what everyone has just said. Um, but I do want to first, just on the issue that you were just talking about, about tuition, um, mention that obviously the same thing has happened at CUNY, which was uh, first established as the Free Academy in 1847 and spent 150 years um, tuition free. And then this open admission policy was introduced in the late 60s after the student uh, uprisings of the 60s. And so then there was this very really incredible influx of um, students of color into the CUNY system, which lasted for exactly seven years. Um, well, I mean, it's still predominantly students of color. Um, but then in 1976 is when they had a fiscal crisis that led to in the introduction of tuition into CUNY. And um, in fact, I think it's important to note that the state aid has been steadily decreasing since that moment. And 2017 was the year that public schools began to receive more revenue from tuition than from the state. Um, so it just like feeds to everything you're saying about how now like, yeah, the students are paying a lot more than they can afford in my classes. Um, and there's a group at CUNY, I, I'd like to just give a shout out to the awesome free CUNY um, students and activists who Rafa has been working with pretty closely. They've been, um, they've been at the forefront of, I saw some people in the chat were asking about the A for all policy for this semester. And so um, they've really been just awesome allies and advocates for us. They wrote a, a solidarity letter um, for the grade action and they've been promoting A for All in terms of like raising awareness and consciousness and education. And as someone was saying earlier, like professors, full-timers listen to the students more than they listen to adjuncts in some ways. And so if you have students telling you like, hey, there's this petition, <coughs> excuse me, um, you should sign it. Then suddenly they're like, oh, I guess students do care and we're not throwing them under the bus. Um, but the danger zone question, <coughs> excuse me, um, again, like I think it's just people really do need to be taking risks right now. Um, I mean, it's just funny that you hear this rhetoric that we're in this unprecedented crisis moment. Um, we should be bending over backwards to accommodate um, you know, our classrooms. And like, I agree with all of that, but then when it comes to actually advocating for our labor conditions, people are like, oh, no, 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 like, you know, don't get too drastic. Like, be, be careful. It's not, you know, it's like not the time or whatever. Um, and often in New York state, people, um, default to referring to the Taylor Law, which of course um, bans public employees from striking. Um, and it was a, a sort of coalition with union bureaucrats in the 60s. And it's um, so people will say like, oh, we don't want to strike. It's illegal. And that just it keeps coming up and coming up. And it's just like a thorn in our flesh as organizers all the time. Um, but people need to be educated about the risks of the Taylor Law. And also that if we stand up collectively and if we get like a 90%, 92% of CUNY faculty voted for strike authorization in 2016, despite the Taylor law. So I think that as we continue building these coalitions, um, we can help people learn to take risks in a way um, that doesn't feel so individualistic. Yeah, no, I mean, the Taylor law, is, is, is that's New York specific, right? But versions of that exist in, in most states. And yet we should remember, right, that was just a couple of years ago where K-12 teachers across the country, right, led a massive strike wave, including in places where striking was, of public employees was illegal. So as we know, the question of legality, ultimately, when it comes down to it, is a question of power and is ultimately a political question. And at least, I mean, one thing you've, you've, you suggested we can do to start to shed some of this neoliberal c confinement is to at least talk about the, the need to bring back the you know job actions and strike as a tool in the labor movement right when what do we have ultimately uh when you know when we're dealing with people who will not be persuaded by good argument and enlightened you know principle right what do we have in terms of power if we if we don't have the ability to withhold our labor right i mean maybe there are other sources of power but that's certainly a big one if you're talking about a labor movement um, we had one question, more of a, a provocation as much as a question from online again, uh, which is about, which something I just like to, to mention, and maybe we can come back to it. I want to bring in a couple more voices, but is the idea of what about abolishing the two-tier system altogether? 
K-12, you know, at least, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are all kinds of marginalized workers within K-12, but certainly we have examples in our society where the idea of a two-tier labor force is still seen as anathema. What about abolishing the two-tier system altogether? I mean, I should point out here in Massachusetts, we have plenty of full-timers. Sometimes I jokingly, half-jokingly call ourselves double-timers, right? Unlike California, we don't have that kind of limit on the number of courses we teach. Here at UMass Boston, we are all in the same union, and we do have, we have fought for some protections for, for non-tenure track faculty that I think are exemplary in some ways. But even as we win that, this goes back to a point Wendy made, even as we win continuing appointments for non-tenure track folks after a certain period, we see the administration smuggle in into the contract a new precarious category of associate lecturer, right? That doesn't qualify for some of those benefits that the that the the new tier of NTTs won, right? So right now that's principally the group that was just hit with 300 non-layoff layoff, non-reappointment non notices a couple of weeks ago at UMass Boston. Non-tenure, we've won all these things. Our previous union uh, leader said, you know, would often say our NTT contract is the exemplary for the whole nation, and yet within it are these vulnerabilities. So obviously getting rid of the two tier system in higher ed is more, it's not even just two tiers, it may be four tiers when you really start breaking it down now in different ways. Um, but I mean, what about that? You know, that, that, that idea of, of really trying to abolish this very inequity, you know, instead of just reforming this, really getting beyond the tiered system altogether. I'm gonna let that sit and bring in Ben, uh, who's been very patient. And then after that, John, and then our Arizona team, who speaking to the issue of precarity has opted to remain anonymous or pseudonymic on this call in order to protect themselves as they speak out about conditions they're facing. Uh, ben, you, you, uh, we spoke, Ben, are you there? Ben Stork from Seattle, are you still on the phone? Still on the, on the Zoom? I am. All right, great. We only, we only uh, hear you when you, sp see you when you speak. Okay. <laughs> speak to be visible, maybe a metaphor. Uh, <laughs> All right, Ben, take it away. I know we talked before the show, you had a lot of things that, that you were prepared to speak on. One of them was opportunities that might be latent in this crisis. Uh, also, obviously you had other things on your mind. What, what strikes you from today's conversation? What would you like to add? Well, well, I wanna start by just uh, thanking Wendy Boyda and Bobby Lee for all the uh, really great things they've shared. Um, I am on board with all of their critiques and let me just uh, kind of jump on. Uh, the Facebook question real quick. Um, I think it's abolished tenure or universalized tenure. Um, I think that that is the line. Um, and I, I would just sort of follow that up by saying what higher ed needs is militancy. Um, it is a sector populated by rule followers um, who uh, are very afraid to break rules. And that is, uh, I think, a primary blocker of organizing. Um, if the administration, sorry, He's heard me talking, so now he's got to get We have a cat caucus going on now, it looks like. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I think that that's a major block to organizing um, because it, it manages to layer on top rules on top of rules. Uh, you have the internal rules of the institution, then layered on top of that, you get the rules of the state, then the federal guidelines. Um, another thing I would suggest in a similar fashion is uh, the myth of shared governance is a entirely problematic structure uh, built into institutions that um, builds on the tenure, non-tenure track um, structure. And I guess, so I'm throwing a bunch of stuff out, so I kind of want to get it out right away. Um, it's one of the things I have an issue with the, the neoliberal name. Um, I actually think these are, are not particularly new. In fact, I think it's built into the structure of these institutions as liberal institutions. Um, liberal institutions tied to uh, a formalist structure of law um, such that uh, faculty um, will fight for shared governance, which is essentially a pat on the head from the administration, um, but will not fight for each other, right? Um, I, I was giving another talk and I, I researched um, votes of no confidence in presidents, um, which have le led to exactly zero resignations. I actually won, um, but it was combined at Missouri with the threatened strike of the football team. <laughs> um, and in fact, what I found is that um, uh, in a document from a headhunter is that um, these are actually, uh, these are actually um, things that you know, university presidents advertise. Uh, a vote of non-confidence from the faculty is proof that you are willing to stand up, mm. right? Um, so to me, that, that says a lot about the sort of structure of higher ed. Um, to kind of 
pick up on first uh, uh, one of the things that I thought was circulating in the conversation um, before going to maybe more of the organizing question is, is to think about um, higher ed and, and how seductive the, the nostalgia narrative is. Um, I, I think we even started falling into it again, right? When we start talking about how cheap uh, these public institutions used to be. Um, and, and it's not to say I, I think that is a better, that is better, right? We can say those things are better and yet not, um, not um, enshrine them as these golden ages, right? Because I think fundamentally, and I think this is something that Wendy was getting at, these are um, institutions of, of class reproduction. Right? That is their function. It remains their function. Um, they are, they could be um, different organs of social reproduction, but we live in a class society and right now they are functioning as class, as sites of class reproduction. Um, <clears throat> with all the attendant ways that that is complica complicated by other social divisions. Um, and so one of the places I think that that we might think about in terms of our, our <clears throat> Uh, strategies is uh, how we might um, think about the, the way that the uh, relationship to uh, the university and the labor market has uh, emerged as the sort of central point. It's a point that for one thing joins adjuncts to students, right? We are both subject to that aspect of the institution, um, right? Uh, adjuncts are in a sense products of the, um, of the faculty labor market, right? Which is built around the, the exclusivity of tenure. Um, students similarly find themselves uh, going to universities um, to serve to service labor markets. At the same time, the universities re uh, restructure themselves around that question of labor markets, right? I, I teach in a film studies program um, that uh, cannot in any way deliver the education it promises, and yet it, it, it continues to promise that it can provide students with jobs in um, the filmmaking industry. This is a tiny little arts university that literally has about um, six digital cameras, right? Um, and yet that's how it sees itself, right? It, understands itself as this is it, this is its function. Um, so I think if there are ways for us to um, start to push on that conception of the university, um, to push against its uh, the way that it, it has um, become almost entirely ensconced as a function of the labor market. Um, yeah. In which case, right, uh, we, we are selling certificates to enter the labor market. Um, I think that's essentially what universities have converted themselves to being. Um, <clears throat> and the more expensive you can certificate you can buy, the better your chances are um, in the labor market. Uh, now from that, I think um, other aspects that I think come up with that are the need for, um, and I wanna kind of again, shout out uh, the three folks, is, is rank, and rank and file organizing is so central to this. Um, because uh, without rank and file um, organizing, the tenure class tends to be captured by administrative, um, administrative pressures, in part because of the structure of tenure, right? Um, one of the things that I was pretty um, callous about for a long time was, was the precarity of junior tenure faculty, right? Um, they are essentially for that first six years, contingent faculty members. Right, um, subject to this, the same at-will employment structures. So by the time they are um, awarded tenure, the buy-in is incredibly strong, um, which is also why I always worry about folks who say, well, once I get tenure, once I get tenure, this is the subjectivizing process, right? That is what's happening, right? The hailing that, that you refer to, Joe, I think. Um, and so I think that that presses on us to think of new organizing models that, that address that split between rank, um, it, either in terms of how we conceptualize crossing that rank boundary, or, and this is my open question, or pressing on it harder and saying, look, y'all are management, I'm fucking sorry. You're management, you've been converted to management, you should have said no while they were doing it, you didn't, and so I cannot, I cannot simply assume a solidarity here and work to win you over. Instead, I need to start really pushing back. You have hiring and firing power over me, right? I mean, I, the number of times I've had tenure line faculty ask me to stand up for tenure, to preserve tenure, as though by some 
magic, I would eventually get the trickle down benefit of, of preserving and circling the wagons around this very small group. Um, and so I think that that's a, 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 maybe a primary organizing question. Um, I'm not sure how that then ends up with interacting with students, right? Because that's, that's sort of the, uh, a fracture line as well. Um, I know I'm saying a bunch of stuff that's kind of all over the place. Yeah, no, that's great, Ben. Maybe uh, we could pause there and, and yeah. we may come back to students. And I also, because of course we want to not only have our respondents, but also the other uh, members of the, that are online right now, other participants have a chance to jump in. So, I mean, I think you give us a provocative framing, right? Abolish or universalize tenure, right? Universalize or abolish, uh, I think a provocative, uh, you know, Discussion starter and organi organizing question for sure. Uh, let's let's bring in John. Uh, John, uh, we've been talking for years about this stuff. Uh, John, Mer uh, John from uh, Rutgers, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, John. Uh, yeah, it's good to have you with us, John. Uh, what would you like, having listened to this uh, great conversation over the last hour, and it's been over an hour now, what would you like to lift up? What would you like to add to it? I know you've been living this struggle as well as reading and studying it. Uh, what do you want to add? And then we'll go to our uh, our team from Arizona. And then the rest of you who are on the Zoom or on Facebook, if you have a question, please feel free to write it in the chat box and we'll make sure to, to have as many of you uh, involved as possible. John, take it away. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for um, the presentations and this discussion. And I'm not sure I have too much to contribute because a lot of things have been said. Um, but um, just to be transparent, I mean, um, I I'm at Rutgers right now as a non-tenure track full-time faculty member, um, which is contractual, it's renewed by year. Uh, but for over 15 years, I was at City University of New York at CUNY, uh, different locations and, and elsewhere. Um, often I would teach up to um, five or six classes a semester at different locations, including Hofstra University, including Farmingdale, which is part of SUNY. Uh, I was an adjunct organizer for the, for the PSC um, during their first, well, not first, but in the early 2000s when they were going through the, another contract uh, battle um, so yeah, I've been, I've been living this and, and it's been things that I've written about and thought about for a long time. Um, uh, I think, you know, it would be important to, I mean, there's a lot of things to say, right? So, but the first thing I think to start with this sort of question of danger, right? So you're, Joe asked the question, well, what is the danger? Um, and there's a lot of danger, right, right now. Um, and I think one of the, the a couple of things, first of all, uh, the danger of falling into or caving into reformism, I think is a real danger. Um, and reformism comes in various forms. Um, you know, uh, one is, um, you know, to accept the, the sort of scraps that are, um, you know, dulled out, even through union struggle. And I give a lot of credit to the PSC, although I was very critical of, you know, the current contract struggle and, and you know, I was very much in support of the 7K or strike, um, which has sort of amalgamated, I guess, into the organization that Boyd is part of. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think, I think the danger in, in what the unions are doing is to sort of, uh, as Rosa Luxemburg sort of talks about in Reform and Revolution, is to attenuate the struggle, right? In other words, to, um, to kind of normalize contingency. And uh, of course, it's a very delicate balance, right? Because at the same, you know, on, on the one hand, you want to sort of, you know, sort of engage in the sort of bread and butter issues and get better things for, for, for part-time faculty. At the same time, you know, you're, you're normalizing the, the, you know, that element of, of, uh, of, the, of the tier. Um, you know, and other things with reformism would be to, um, you know, cave into sort of like, um, you know, pessimism, because it's very easy, I think, right, especially now to be pessimistic about the future, which, which brings me to a number, a number of things. I mean, you know, the first thing is that, okay, so beyond the reformism, you know, what, you know, what would be, what should be our roles, I think, as educators, and for me, you know, and this is one reason I haven't gotten a full-time job for a long time, is that, you know, I, I fight back against the notion of, of education as a function of capitalist reproduction. Uh, and I have done that throughout my, you know, uh, teaching and so forth. Um, you know, our, our role is essentially, especially in these sort of cash cow courses, which I mostly teach, it's to kind of, you know, uh, reproduce some sort of polished working class, you know, figure, right? You're sort of polishing them for the, as, as, as Ben was talking about, right? So how do we fight back against that? And I think it's central to step up and, 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 and engage in conversations about racism, about systemic racism, about our own, you know, uh, roles as uh, as exploited labor within the academy. I mean, I, I bring that up all the time, and I think other people, Boyda and so forth, have talked about that. Um, you know, and and so you know, to sort of push for the sort of education as freedom, you know, to kind of use Paul Paul Friere's notion, uh, instead of um, you know catering to the banking system of education, 
you know, that's a vision that I think we should embrace and, and try to push forward, particularly in this moment, which, you know, again, getting back to the sort of, well, not to be pessimistic, but the difficulty of organizing in this moment, I think there are a couple of things. First of all, I, I think it's very interesting, you know, flexibility um, has been the name of the game since 2008, especially when, you know, you had the great financial recession. Uh, and at that moment, you know, when the crisis hit, and then when the crisis hit in 2007, for example, I, I just had gotten out of CUNY with my PhD. Um, I couldn't get a full-time position. Um, all, the, all the jobs I applied for were basically just, you know, uh, um, you know, defunded and so forth. But there was a kind of proliferation of, of, of the use of adjunct labor at that point, right? So from 2008 to now, we're seeing that model as sort of the norm. Now we're seeing something different, I think, and that is, you know, the, the elimination of that very workforce. So that brings up a question for me, you know, what, what do they have in store? And again, thinking from the point of view of, you know, the university as a capitalist entity, which it basically it's run according to that business model. Um, so if they're going to just eliminate this entire workforce, that's going to enlarge in what, you know, what Marx calls a reserve army of labor of academics. And so there's going to be a difficulty to organize, right? Because if people are completely let go, well, how are you going to organize people who you don't know where they're going, you know what, you don't know what they're doing. Um, and so, so the question is, what, what do we do with that? Um, or at least just to uh, jump in, right? A, a, a yeah. difficulty of organizing people as campus workers anyway, as or campus, as, as, campus as workers, professors, right. right? You know, because That's they may be unemployed or working, uh, you right. know, service industries after the, right? So yeah, yeah. No, go ahead though, John. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, in, in times of crisis, this is a very convenient mechanism, you know, for, for you know, um, uh, pulling down wages, you know, um, and, and controlling the circulation of labor itself. Um, and this is part of a global problem. I mean, flexibility has, you know, is, is really the name of the game. But the question is, and this is where someone like William Robinson, I think, is a very interesting uh, read. Um, you know, are they moving towards this, um, you know, what he calls mil um, the, uh, militarized accumulation? And that entails uh, particularly um, you know, wielding a heavier hand against, you know, surplus labor. Um, and I don't think we should see ourselves even within the academy as distinct from that global phenomenon. So okay. that's kind of thinking to be a very difficult part of how we organize. Um, okay. that, said, I, that said, I am very optimistic about, you know, the future. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's an the optimism and the pessimism, I guess, and being clear about it. I mean, I guess that, you know, that, uh, that lifts up a couple of questions I'd like just to hear people's responses to. Uh, and then maybe then we'll go to the Arizona team who that's been listening in and I think has a lot to say and I'm really curious how this conversation has been resonating with them. Um, but you know what is the basis for a, for a non naive hope in this moment? Where are the seeds or the shoots or the you know whatever your metaphor is for where you see right the movement the basis for hope that 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 stabs off pessimism in a non idealist non delusional way and also what is the ba you know what is the you know, John talks about the danger of reformism, but then, of course, there's a long, you know, tradition of trying to talk about how you can fight for reforms without becoming reformist, right? So, you know, so what are what are the kinds of reforms of the institution of the state that we could be and should be and maybe are fighting for right now? Um, and, you know, and, and how we would draw the line between, you know, fighting for a certain reform versus, you know, falling into reformism that just kind of reinforces and normalizes uh, the deep problematic nature of the structure. I mean, I think John also hits on, and Ben did as well, right? The need to um, think about how, you know, really class and capitalism and political economy factor in here, right? Uh, and I won't repeat everything that was said there, but there's a lot there, almost overwhelming amount, but I'd like to see if we can concretize it in ways that allows people to think about what we can do. I mean, John, you mentioned Paulo Freire, and, you, and in some sense, you're taking us back to the classroom, at least for a moment, in the pedagogical space to think about, well, like, what are we doing? What can we do uh, in terms of practices? And what are people doing already that we could perhaps spread and share in terms of, you know, kind of short circuiting what the system wants to happen in that classroom, right? I mean, some people have talked already. What looks like Wendy's hand shot up for that. I'd love to hear. So maybe we could hear the whole panel on this. And this is basically take this however you want, but I would love to hear some responses to the respondents and then we'll go to the Arizona team and open it up for who's left. Also, I've got a comment from the chat list, folks that would like this to be part one of a part two discussion, something we can we can talk about. I'm not cutting us off yet. We're almost at 90 minutes, but uh, or at 80 minutes anyway, uh, but something we could think about maybe doing a series on these and getting into more of the concrete nuts and bolts uh, organizing side where we can put this theory into practice. Wendy, we'll go to you first. Uh, Wendy, uh, 
and, and then the others on the on the original panel. Yeah. I'll be yeah. really brief. Frankly, I think that the idea that we can take radical pedagogy into our classes, into the midst of the mess that is current universities and hope to get somewhere is ridiculous. I um, have been teaching for 20 something years. Um, I also, I was once a tenure track professor, denied tenure because of my politics, still teaching the same shit. And although I push students to the left on a regular basis, that's not gonna cut it. So I, I just wanna say that I think that's, 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 a, that's not a good strategy. Okay, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Wendy, I, I appreciate you taking that clear uh, uh, position. Do you, could you flesh that out a little bit for us? Like, why do you think that, what's the limit there? Is it just the students that are in the classroom aren't the students we need, aren't the people that need to be organized already? It's <laughs> gentrified or what, what, do you, what do you? In volcanoes, when, a, when there's a lava flow, there ends up being these small things called kipuku, where green things grow, right? And so everything will be covered with lava, hot molten lava, but there'll be small areas where green things can still grow. And that's sort of what it's like to be a radical, a Marxist teacher in, in the university system. Because in the end of the day, that's not the traction that we need, right? And so us fighting to make sure that we're teaching students to fight right, is, isn't enough because they, they go to some other class where they take statistics or econ or marketing um, and it goes all out of their pretty little head. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's a viable strategy to challenge the university. I think it's, you know, as a teacher, it's satisfying, but I don't think it's a viable long-term strategy. Okay. Maybe a starting point, but not an end point, but certainly not an adequate, not, a, not an adequate, if that's the only thing we're doing, we're not doing enough. I mean, I would agree with that anyway, not to put words, I'm not putting words in your mouth, just my mouth. Uh, ben, uh, Ben has his hand up, looks eager. I can't see the other, let me, let me go to the uh, the gallery view. Uh, our Bobby and uh, Boyd, I wanna get in on this too, but Ben, let's let's hear a, a brief comment from you and then we'll go back to our panelists and back to, uh, and then back to the Arizona folks. I've, I've said their name 12 times. Okay, go ahead. Ben. I just want to second what Wendy said, um, which is not an argument for not doing <clears throat> radical pedagogy in the classroom, to be clear. It's just, I don't know, it's not a strategy, um, right? And I think the thing that to, to add to Wendy's point is we also have to think of how the university has functioned in relation to the left. And in fact, incorporating these critiques is part of its reaction, right? Um, Let's face it, uh, there are most Marxists are at universities, and yet the university is still a capitalist institution. So uh, that should say something, <laughs> right? Um, that's not to say we shouldn't teach those things, but I don't think we can um, see them as a promise. The uh, second thing I would just uh, want to throw out there is, is on the question of reform. Um, I kind of think uh, I, the non reformist reform movements are awesome, but I also think maximalist demands are the way to go because the, the institution is going to only think reform anyways, right? So you say, uh, you say abolish, um, abolish grades, and they'll come up with something else, right? So the way you can even achieve reform is by rejecting that. You don't ask for reform, you demand revolution, and maybe you'll get reform too, right? Um, but I don't see any reason why we would ever enter the bargaining or the, the struggle and immediately say, well, we're gonna give up our big ask and will you give us a little bit something else? I, right. I think um, reform me, comes from that struggle, but. I love what you're saying, Ben. Let me let me play devil's advocate for one second because I was, I'm part of a, a democratic progressive radical caucus, which actually is tenure track and non-tenure track at UMass Boston. And early in the pandemic crisis, we started having debates about if we should put out a bold demand for free tuition, right? as one of a number of things, right? Knowing, especially now because of all the people taking economic hits, right, all these families. And of course, everybody in the caucus agrees with this as a principle, and yet there was a lot of resistance. And even, I would say myself, the pragmatic side to say, if we put that out so bold, how do we get taken seriously by our colleagues enough to get something, get the momentum going, right? So maybe we should say, hold, you know, now, this is obviously, I mean, I don't know if this is every situation is different, but I mean, maybe that is that just a symptom of the limits of the constituency of trying to organize, especially tenure track, but maybe not only tenure track faculty, uh, or I don't know, is, I mean, there's a question here, I guess, but how to be revolutionary in a pragmatic way too. Um, you know, what's something we're probably not gonna solve today, but do you wanna to respond to that a little bit in terms of that, that tension? Do you recognize that tension between being 
and I don't just mean like being taken seriously by conservative folks that like don't want big change, but making it clear that this is a concrete thing and not just rhetorical radicalism at the same time. I don't know, right? So, yeah. you know, I don't know. How do you? I'll put I, I think you can function. The, yeah. I think you can function in the same way um, with your colleagues as well. You start with the maximalists. The reformists are going to say the reformist thing anyways, um, and maybe you can push them to greater reforms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. the same kind of, I think, tactic. I think if it, this is how I think of my own sort of position. Um, if we go with the maximal, um, we're more likely to produce more than less, okay. right? That, that is, um, it, it's the, when we immediately go to give up, right? To say, okay, it's not practical to make this demand. Well, we've already ceded the ground. How can you win if you immediately give up, right? Okay. Now we may need to make compromises, right? That is, that's politics, mm -hmm. but I don't know why we would do that in advance. Right? Okay. And I think that would go with colleagues as well. And, and in that sense, it's, it's rhetoric too, but it's rhetoric in a, uh, I think in a really move people way rhetoric. Uh, no, no. I, I, you may be moving me as we speak. No, I appreciate the, the comment. Um, but we have Bobby Lee and, and Boyda. I was going to give you a chance to respond to some of the respondents, and then we'll go out to Arizona. Uh, Bobby Lee? Yeah, okay. I wrote down notes, so hopefully I can stay more on track this time, because my brain likes to talk, and then it just kind of goes off track. Um, the first thing was about the tenured faculty, because I know Wendy was like, no, give your thoughts. And you had said, Joe, no, we kind of want your thoughts on tenure. Um, and then Ben said, it's either tenure or, or bust, essentially, right? It was either tenure for everybody or tenure for nobody. And I think that that is something that we need to talk about in a very real way, because what I'm finding is that when it comes to these tenured faculty members, the fact that they toe the line, they often tend to have administrative goals or they just want to be cushy in their job. I found it, I've seen it, I, I watch it happen, right? Um, and they, um, and they're not always the best professors. Like the, the interesting thing to me has been with online certification. So in the community college system in California, we're capped per district, which means that people will often teach on three or four different, in three or four different districts um, each semester. So they're teaching nine classes in on five campuses, right? Because you're capped at three classes or whatever the situation is, right? So to make ends meet, that's what you're doing, which means you're in all these different unions, you're under all these different work rules, right? And all of this stuff, which means you probably have been online certified at at least one of them at some point in time to try to get an online class so you don't have to drive so much. But yet in this time of us all having to move online, they will not allow part-time or adjunct faculty members to be the one who teach these online credentialed classes, even if they're the ones credentialed. They have to be credentialed at each and every location. So not even in the fucking district that they work in, which LA district has nine campuses, but at each fucking campus for the districts, right? Because each Senate for each campus gets to choose what the, what in the fuck, your, your version of Canvas, which is what we all use in California, including the CSUs, is not any more fucking special than anyone else's Canvas, okay? It's all the same shit, but we have to be certified at each one because theirs is more elite, right? That shit. But then the ones who are not certified have been the tenured folks. How the fuck in 20 years do you not know how to, how to use your email or how to use Canvas? How, how did you not use any of your professional development to keep up with the times? Like what is going on, right? But they're the ones who are going to be preferred to do this. They're going to have sometimes the worst pedagogy there. A lot of those students that are complaining to me about those three hour Zoom lectures are by full time faculty members, right? Because they've never bothered to do that work, right? So they're but yet they get to keep tenure because they have it. And the purpose of tenure was to research and talk about controversial subjects and not have what happened to Wendy happen, right? Where you don't get tenure, you don't get the job. It wasn't so that you could be an awful professor who lectures, who doesn't do committee work, because I hear that all the time, that it's about a third of the full-time faculty who do all of the work on the campus, right? And I hear it from full-timers. And then, and then you get to keep your job, or you're an awful professor who the students are constantly complaining about, or you're a blatant racist, which I've heard, and it's been founded in for like founded that the students they've done investigations, the professor is blatantly racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever, and they're toxic in the classroom, but they're tenured, so they keep their job, right? While the rest of us sit around hoping they die or retire so we can find a job. I mean, like, what the fuck is wrong with this system, right? Like, it, it's just really, really bad. So I, I had to touch on the tenured stuff that I was feeling. That yeah. 
was the first thing. Um, but the other part is we really need to somehow, and I finally, because I don't know that my union at the state or the national level knows what they let in the door. Like, I don't think that they realize what happened when they let me in. Um, but CFT and AFT are both finally starting to talk about finding a way to press for um, basically a movement from part-time to full-time positions that we can track into that. Why? Because I saw in here, right, and Wendy talked about it, and I saw um, like Claire and other people saying that that's like their passion is their students and their community. Right. So why are you not hiring your part-timers or your non-tenure track folks in those positions? Who knows your students and your community better than the folks who have been teaching there for 15 or 20 years? How? When I tell people that there is no amount of time that I can work as a part timer and eventually get a full time job, they look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, What does that mean? How you could be part time for 20 years and never get a job? And I'm like, Yeah. And they're like, What bullshit is that? I'm like, I don't fucking know. Good question. Right. Like, so the way in which this whole thing is set up to privilege those who the system likes, who the system wants, right, who look best, I have found in my research, I heard it from college presidents, I heard it from chairs, I heard it from deans that the way those job ads are written is either because they got someone they want or they got people they don't want. And so they write that job ad for one person to qualify or for others to be completely written out. It is not as neutral as they make it seem and those equal opportunity, you know, we have to fly it for everybody bullshits that go out. So I think that a real conversation needs to happen and this stuff really needs to be called out. Like it, cause it's known it's, I, it came out in my dissertation. Like people said this to me on record that that's what was happening. So, yeah. and you know, uh, Bobby Lee, you really underscore, right, how a kind of divide and rule kind of logic is built into the system. You could also tell your students, well, maybe if I write the best, you know, the superstar book in my field, then I could get a tenure track job and leave you, right? Because yeah. they'll never hire a non tenure track folk because they don't want to set a precedent, right? To scare, you know, to, to make it seem like to, to, to put that little, that little bit of hope in the minds of all the NTTs that maybe that someday they'll, that they deserve to be treated as, as, as equals as well. You know, it's so many different ways in which the bureaucracy itself kind of like fragments us and, and exhausts people. It's a job just to have a, have a job, right? All that, all the paperwork you're talking about. Could we actually bring Boyda in and then, and, uh, and we will, we will come back to you all before, before we, uh, before we finish up, but uh, Boyda. Uh, well, I, I honestly don't have too much to add to this really um, fantastic conversation. And I'm very curious about the mysterious Arizona folks. Um, <laughs> but Arizona, I'll just yeah. say, I think I'd like to echo what Ben was saying. I think that maximalist demands are really crucial and um, fighting against the, the weirdly structural kind of pressure to make everyone feel comfortable when you talk to them. Like even when we're organizing adjuncts, there are some groups who are like, oh, we're not gonna use the language of striking. We're just gonna like, you know, use mutual aid and like get to know how they're doing and see what problems they're having. And like, we're gonna be really nice to them. And it's kind of like all this liberal bullshit. Um, and then like, you know, it might, we're a little, we're afraid of the Taylor law. So we're gonna like wait till later to start using that language. But it's absolutely about having those hard conversations from the very beginning um, and, and making people feel uncomfortable because like, why not? Yeah, we are. I mean, I think as an industry, as people have indicated, right, we're often taught to think good persuasion, right? And civility too, but good arguments can, can move the world, right? Uh, whereas we, you know, and not people don't, aren't comfortable with the discomfort and, and just admitting this is about power, and, right? And even the arguments are part of that process. No, I hear you. Uh, well, we, uh, by popular demand, we're going to go to Arizona. Arizona team, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't know who I'm speaking to right now. Uh, Claire. Claire. All right. Claire, you want to get us started? I know you have a couple folks on the line. You've been coordinating those, so I don't know if you're the spokesperson or what, but Claire, what have you been thinking of this conversation? What's going on in Arizona? Okay, well, first of all, I think these are excellent points, and I think there's a lot of complaints that are legitimate with the adjunct non-contingent uh, faculty. Um, I had originally spoken to you about going over some um, specific complaints that I had, but I'm starting to wonder if that's the best use of my time at this point. Um, we all know what the problems are. We, we have gone over those for the past you know, 90 minutes. We, are, we live them every day. What I'm beginning to feel is that we need to organize and however that looks is up for debate, however that looks can be discussed. Um, but the key is at this point, we know what the problems are. We have to at this point move forward in organizing ourselves and taking action. I'm actually um, an adjunct faculty, but I'm also a K-12 teacher, high school English teacher. 
And I'm in Arizona and we did, I was part of the strike a couple of years ago. And I will tell you that that was the only action that happened that actually enacted change. We have a very conservative governor who flat out said that he was never going to raise salary. He was never going to reduce class size. It's never going to happen. And it was until Arizona teachers walked out that he, you know, and it was probably, you know, a couple months into it that he began to listen to um, the issues. The problem, in my opinion, was that they didn't take it far enough. And now K-12 teachers really have not seen a great change. They've seen a little bit of a change, but not a great change. So I think we need to look at that as an example and look at what is possible, but also, you know, look at it as a cautionary tale of not going far enough, possibly. Um, the comments that have been made about the tenure track, um, you know, the conditions with adjunct faculty are terrible. We already know that. I think at this point, we need to focus our efforts not on rehashing what the conditions are. We live them every day. We need to focus 100% of our efforts upon what can we do now. And I think that's open for debate. I think that there are a lot of possibilities. I think we do not need to reinvent the wheel. I think we need to look at past examples. Um, somebody had posted in the comments, there were a lot of great models that we could maybe look into. We could look at organization in the past. We could look at unions that are already organizing. We don't have to keep reinventing this over and over again. And I think the most important thing not to do is just go over and over and over the problems. We already know the problems. You know, like I said, we live them every day. So um, at this point, I think we need to dedicate ourselves to moving forward to solving the issues. And now what that looks like, is up, up in there. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that question and returning us to that. I mean, as much as sharing stories and analysis is important, if we don't get to that question of what we can do now, uh, then we're really missing, we're missing the boat. Uh, is there anyone else from Arizona that would like to add to Carol's uh, opening point or her crucial question, really? Okay, maybe we'll take that then for now and then go back to the group. Is there, and then, and then uh, if there are other folks on the, on the chat, well, we'd like to uh, add. Dale? Yes, go ahead. Oh, so sorry. I was trying to figure out the Zoom thing. Oh, okay. The mute. Yeah. Oh, Zelda. There you go. Zelda. Go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry. I'm from. Well, well hold really the question about what is what concretely can be done organizing wise, and go to you, Zelda. Yes. Well, thank you. Actually, that's where I was sort of going. This is a, a fabulous conversation, and also like the rest of you, I've been thinking about these issues and living them and wondering about them for, you know, many, many years. Um, I started off, at, you know, from Flint, Michigan as a single mom and wound up at, at, you know, in a PhD program. And so anyway, the whole class analysis, I mean, everything I understand. So I've been an exploited adjunct for 22 years. Um, and, you know, I do think of myself as sort of a radical. So one of the things, I mean, I think that when we're talking about organizing, you asked the question about the dangers. And then also the other question you asked, Joe, was about, what's um you know there's sort of like the structure so we understand the structure i mean we sort of all have the same understanding of the structure but also what's in our heads and so i think if we're going to talk about organizing and what that looks like i mean i also think that academia is so filled with sort of meritocracy um that we we need to figure out like an organizing strategy that deconstructs those roles and and those ways of seeing that are really um, very neoliberal and very reformist. I mean, for myself, I don't want just a full-time job. I want to see the transformation of society. I just finished a, a, a research job that involves, you know, I, I, won't, I won't go on, but basically like looking at community college students and substance abuse issues and mental health and wellness. And, you know, the, the sort of neoliberal answer was counselors, more counselors. It's like, no, um, we need education to um you know address these problems i mean i don't want to be teaching students i mean i don't want to be a full-time faculty when half of my students are hungry and they don't have anywhere to live but um you know that's that's the problem like i want to see like a real radical uh re you know like a, you know revolution in the country well anyway but how can we go about like this this thing that's in our heads because i think in academia we're socialized to be very competitive 
So then I'm thinking, oh, you know, I have these socially constructed symbols that are better than yours. And so then I want this full-time job because I deserve it. So how in the world, I mean, I think part of what you were saying about what's in our heads, how can we deconstruct what is in our heads? I mean, and the students' heads too, because they're completely socialized into this corporate model as well. I mean, oh, if I'm lucky, I'll get a piece of the pie, even though we know that's not even how it's working anymore. So I think that the idea that you know, it's so dangerous right now. I'm sorry, I'm talking so much, but it's so dangerous right now um, to organize because everyone's sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, food, you know, there's food insecurity everywhere. We see the food lines, we know what's happening, but you know, it, it needs to be like a larger conversation than having a full-time job. It needs to be about how can we radically restructure, you know, even our mindsets. So I don't know the answer to that, but I think the idea of having another conversation about that in another series super important because then we can talk about specific things that we can do so that's what i have to say yeah uh, zelda you're, you're speaking my language or your music to my ears i mean I, I think you know points that so many of you may deserve to be dug into in this you know theory i mean i don't think i think it's a mistake right to, to counterpose and nobody has here really i don't think counterposing action from like theory or analysis right we need both working in tandem right you know theory informed action and action informed theory and uh and I think, you know, people, there's been a very lively chat box. I haven't had a chance to read through it here. I'm, we're going to save that and look at it. But I think there's a lot to, to work through. And I think we, another show, I'd be more than happy. I mean, how many of you out there by a show of hands would like to return for a, for a deeper, another deep dive on this in, in a way that's building constructively on some of our shared analysis? I'm seeing pretty much everyone whose hand I can see, I see everyone who's visible. Uh, I don't know if that's a cue to wrap up since we're going to do it again, but I think we still have a few more minutes we should probably use here. I mean, it strikes me one, one, one famous phrase is the educator needs to be educated, right? I mean, I think we're, we're, we're taught in higher ed by definition with us with masters or PhDs to think we, we know a lot, right? But it actually may be the case we need to learn a lot more from the K-12 teachers who actually understand that they're workers, they're right, than, than, than the people that we're taught to look up to without discounting theoretical knowledge at all, right? Um, I think this point about how we're socialized. I mean, I guess, Zelda, one point I wanted to make there is just, I'm not only saying like we need to change our heads, like it's that first head, then world, but the practices within our reach that our own in our own institutions, in our own habits, in our own departments and unions, the practices that reinforce and reproduce, you know, ideology, right? I think as, as I'm thinking about what are the practices we can transform right now or the practices we can enact that can, that can lead to a different way of thinking, right? Or at least give us some hope of not falling into the same old traps. Um, do we have other questions who that, uh, is there another Arizona person who wants to weigh in? I really appreciate what you all bring in. So many good things already. Yeah, I'm, I'm another Arizona person, kind of, sort of. Okay, um, and, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm, uh, and thank you to Ben for telling me about this. I would really be love to come back um, and have a second, um, just do this again and think about the nuts and bolts of things because um, I had been working up at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. And one of the things that's really difficult is if you happen to have <laughs> a group of people who is really willing and able and trying to organize on the ground, but National HQ ignores you. Uh, this happened with the AAUP ignoring us for two full years and then the American Federation of Teachers ignoring us and then sending us people to kind of help on the ground but who were mostly K through 12 organizers who did not know just how incredibly nasty and I mean nasty the president of the university was and she had form um, she had done a lot of damage at Southern Illinois University but because she had done the damage that was exactly the kind of damage that the Arizona Board of Regents really loves to see she was screwing over faculty, uh, she was hired. She's still there and she's making a ton of money. So now you've got this tiny little town of about 45,000 people, except when students are there, looking at one of two of the main employers in the entire town being decimated. There are talks of 20 to 25% job cuts, not furloughs, but cuts um, on the NAU campus. That means a hell of a lot of rent isn't gonna be paid, a hell of a lot of mortgages are gonna go into foreclosure. Um, and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, and the one of the things that's been hard is that this little tiny band of people, because we get burned out on trying to organize and getting nowhere, 
there ends up being a shift in the people in charge of that union from year to year, or maybe every two years to every two years. And it's already in a place where people are afraid to unionize. There are people with uh, PhDs in their 40s who are positive that if they join a union, they are going to go to jail, okay? So even trying to explain to people that, no, 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 our, our goal is not to create bargaining rights in Arizona. We just want to get to a place of being able to get meet and confer rights. That's where we are in a right to work state. So even understanding what a right to work state means and what the limits are is really difficult. So I would love if there's a second time to come around and just talk about the nuts and bolts of what do you do? How do you get boots on the ground? Who are the people? And do I have to name names at AAUP and AFT to shame them in front of other people uh, in order to get some help? Um, so far that's worked a little bit, but um, yeah. that's the kind of thing it'd be really great to talk more about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm seeing what a visible consensus of those who are able to be uh, visible uh, on this idea of some sort of concrete steps in radical higher ed organizing. Tr what is trans you know, building transformative organizing, right? Uh, not, not just limited to higher ed, but, but with what we've got, right, coming out of this higher ed situation. Um, there's been such a lively chat box. It's quite possible I've missed someone who has a question that they would like to ask now as we are uh, at almost, uh, you know, we have, I guess we could say we have 10 minutes left to do a full two hours if people would like to. There's certainly a lot on the table uh, here. I mean, I guess, I mean, I'd like to come back to, I think it was Carol's question about you know, what can we do now? I mean, what are, I mean, I'm sure we're all thinking, we're all worrying, we're all struggling on various fronts. What are we doing? Uh, what are we aware of that's being done right now that we think needs to be uh, signal boosted right now that, that, uh, that people, you want people to know about? I mean, I could share one thing from UMass Boston, following the, the mass non-reappointment letters to over 300 non-tenure track faculty, our union caucus, and ultimately our union, in fact, our union caucus has helped to win power within our local union, which is one big step. We could talk about the importance of taking back your local so that it's not just a serve business union, service union, but a social movement, uh, class conscious union, or at least moving in that direction. Uh, but we, you know, we, as a first step, we got a petition going, we got more, we got 350 faculty, tenure track and non-tenure track to sign a, a letter of protest, right? Uh, opposing those cuts and which we're taking to the media, which we're taking to the administration, which we're taking to other faculty. Um, and we also have, have devised a pledge we're going to be asking people to take and giving both to chairs of departments as well as to individual faculty saying, we will not accept additional students in any classes. If you're planning to increase class size, which of course is what they'll have to do if they don't hire back these people, right? Right? Uh, you know, you're going to have to find some other way to do it and actually get our chairs who are, and for the last couple of years have been in a union of their, their own, our chair, department chairs have unionized, right? You know, yeshiva decision be damned or whatever, they're in a union. So, so I mean, we're finding ways to try to see, you know, there are potential allies among some of the chairs insofar as they are faculty too, and, and at least in a place like UMass Boston are at least nominally, in some cases, quite sincerely committed to kind of a public urban mission. Right, which has a social justice component. So that's one thing we're doing, right? Is trying to build NTT and TT opposition and even chair opposition to cuts and workload increases that will be the flip side of the cuts. That's not enough, but that's one thing we're doing. Uh, Wendy or uh, Bobby Lee or others who are on the call, what are things that are going on right now on or off campus that you think we should be supporting or at least be aware of that people may not be uh, aware of right now? So real quick, I want to say that my partner is Kelly Collins. She's the co-chair of the Caucus of Working Educators, which is the rank and file caucus in the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. I learn a lot from her all the time. One of the things I learn is that there's this huge disconnect between K through 12 and higher ed. And if we want to deal with some of these questions, we need to have more, much more of a relationship there. Um, but uh, at Temple, um, um, adjuncts and NTTs have gotten together to organize a rank and file caucus. Um, we're, we're still taking our first steps, but I think the reality is we need unions that are not business model unions and that are centered on the demands of contingent faculty. Because if unions are centered on the contingent, on contingent faculty demands, then everybody will benefit. Um, and, and I think that's the bottom line. I don't have any kind of crystal ball and I don't know what's gonna happen, but I will say that in the midst of pandemic and economic depression, 
we have a lot better argument to people when they're losing their jobs, right? We, we, people are all, we're all going to be fucked, right? And so we can either sit around in misery or we can fight because we have nothing to lose but our chains. And so I think that's part of, you know, the, the organizing momentum that we have in this moment. Yeah, powerful. Bobby Lee, Boyda? Uh, yeah, I'll pick up where Wendy left off with, we have nothing to lose but our chains. And I think that we need more adjunct faculty to be aware of that. Like you're not losing a full-time tenure track job because there's really not that many, right? So people always ask me, why are you so willing to speak out? Why do you say these things? Like, you know, you could destroy your career. I'm like, because I could literally make the same at Target and at least they'd give me fucking benefits. And Starbucks would at least give me a degree, pay for a degree that would actually like get me a real job, right? So I have nothing to lose. Like, what am I gonna lose? I don't even have fucking healthcare, right? Like, so why not? I'm literally losing, losing nothing if I speak up. Um, so I think that that's the first thing. So um, I wanted to pick up that. But I think that one thing, I don't know that it's happening um, or in that way that maybe you mean it, but I think you need to make people uncomfortable all the time. I, there's not one person who's ever met me in my life who does not know my feelings about adjuncts. They, they know everybody. They, and I have people who are like, what the fuck's an adjunct? And I have to explain it to them. I am, and this is not a bragging point. This is just point of context. I'm a, De a delegate for the Democratic Party of my district or whatever, right? So I've gone to the Democratic Convention and I've gone to those events. And as soon as they were sitting there talking to about, you know, the gig workers and we got this bill for the gig workers, and they're talking about Lyft and Uber and this, this evil private sector that's working on gig workers. I was like, so at what point do we talk about the fact that you're doing the same thing in public education with adjunct faculty, right? At what point are we going to talk about that? And so like the chair of the Democratic Party of California was like, uh, we could talk at some point, right? But I'm a delegate. So you have to talk to me because you want my endorsement. So I'm in everybody's face. I did it to Tom Sire. I did it to Julian Castro. I was, hey, can we get a selfie? And they were like, sure. And I was like, by the way, higher ed's in danger because there's an adjunctification of higher ed and it's explaining students. And they were like, huh? Like they don't know what's happening to them, but I do it every time I meet someone in power. I do it to every administrator, every political official, everybody I meet, whether it's a friend or family member. And everyone's like, Okay, whatever you want. And then when you're in that room and they know who you are and they know what you've said when they're talking, because I've been in the AFT meetings with Randy Weingarten and she's talking and she's like, oh, you know, we're doing this, this and this. And then they look over and they see me and they go, oh, and, and for our part-timers, we're going to do, right? They start scrambling because you're there and you're forcing them to address the issue. The more we're quiet, the more we don't say anything, like you like the more that they can do this, you have to make, we have to make ourselves visible and you have to make them uncomfortable. And I do it all the time. And I'm telling you, they don't know what they let in. I know they regret it every day, but my name is so attached to CFT and AFT now. They have to, right? Like they have to put me on those panels, but it is what yeah. it is. No, but Bobby Lee, you're, you're an inspiration with what you're, what you're doing and saying. I mean, even the so-called progressives who are talking about higher ed reforms, you know, the Bernie Sanders type uh, program, whatnot, right? We're talking about free tuition at public institutions, talking about student debt, but very seldom, if ever, talking about the actual uh, teaching slash learning conditions that are on the campus as far as contingent faculty are concerned, right? I'm very seldom talking about the reinvestment that would have to happen in order to transform those conditions within the present system, right? So there's, there's I mean, there's no shortage of people who need need to be uh, pressured. That's for that's for damn sure, Bobby Lee. Thank you for that. Boyd up. Okay, real quick. Um, I think that, well, we're, Rafa is pursuing a lot of the same tactics that you were talking about, Joe. Like, I mean, we just had the, we have a pledge, we had the grade pledge and we got 800 signatures, which of course the PSC um, will say, like it, we need like 20,000 signatures, it was impossible. Um, but we don't have nearly the same institutional supports or access to contact lists that the PSC had and they refused to circulate it for us. Um, so I think those 800 signatures are potential allies now and supporters of us. So the fact is that we are now like building a base and we are gonna reach out to those people and still, and, and try to, you know, keep fighting I think also it's just really important, um, as others have said, not to cede any ground at all. I mean, one thing is first we thought that, okay, 40% of John Jay adjuncts might be getting non-reappointed. Now they're saying like, oh, it's only going to be 10% and we're supposed to be like, that's great. The PSC is doing a really great job. And, you know, that's the kind of reformist trap that you, you fall into. But it's like, no, no one should be getting laid off right now. Why are the people lowest on the totem pole, like on the cutting block? And um, while people, while the CUNY chancellor is making 
making, you know, well over six or uh, six, six big figures. I mean, it's just so ridiculous to me. Um, for example, the there was an, a meeting recently about un unemployment insurance and there were like 300 adjuncts there and the PSC was so excited that they had such a popular meeting that like hundreds of people were there because they're supporting um, all of these unemployment applications that have to happen. It's like how, it's just, their mindset is so backwards right now and it, it seems like such a mental trap. Um, and another thing we do, I'm just going to give a brief plug to Zoom bombing as a, an effective tactic right now that really like, except unless they disable the chat, like they did recently at the PSC delegate assembly because we were making too much noise, um, that this new digital medium actually can open up more possibilities for um, for protests, for getting your voice heard, for like, um, yeah, for for just like showing up at meetings that you maybe couldn't, weren't welcome or privy to previously. There are a lot of new possibilities right now, even though we're not all out on the streets. Mm -hmm. there, there really are opportunities to at least have conversations with people and to reach people. I mean, we are finding also in our, in our union a much escalated uh, turnout at union meetings and at caucus meetings compared to, I mean, this, this people are incredibly busy in various ways, but there's been a kind of flattening of time you know, I mean, people don't have, uh, you know, any, can't go out at night or whatever and so forth. It's, so it is possible to strike up conversations, real time conversations, uh, and, and to build on that basis as well as I suppose to, to interrupt other people's Zooms if you can. If you, I don't know if I should say that on Zoom or not. Um, so does anybody else, I mean, I, I actually want to flag one thing you said. Uh, let's see, I think it was, I'm, I'm blanking on who said it, but the moment ago, I know, boy, you said it about, oh, they said it would be for 30% of adjuncts or 30% of faculty that are gonna be cut. Now it's only gonna be 10%, few, right? I mean, I think this is also a danger right now that the the doom, the, the reality-based kind of doom and gloom is actually used as a management strategy, right? To like scare us with the total apocalypse and then, then, then like, so that we'll breathe a sigh of relief when we only get half of it. You know, like at UMass Boston, they've let about 300 people go right now. I bet they'll bring most of them back and those people might feel really glad to have their jobs, right? Their essential work that was always needed back, right? So I think, I don't know, I don't have an answer to how we deal with this. I mean, there's a reality to the grim circumstances, but there's also a myth that people in power want to turn it into as if things are inevitable, right? And as if we should just be grateful for whatever we get when we know that usually in many of us for contingent faculty, the salary uh, that we get is probably paid for by just like one or two students sitting in our class. Like the students, the money they're paying, they should be getting individual, individualized tutoring. I had a, a, a colleague in creative writing who once told me, people understand, Americans understand that you can't teach bowling 15 or 20 people at a time. Why do they think you can teach writing 20 people at a time or 30 at a time or 40 at a community college, right? I mean, I mean, I think it's very key. I mean, it can become a cliche. I think we need to own it in a deeper way that that our our teaching, our working conditions are the learning conditions of our students. Um, and o only when we really make that point resonate are we going to have the mass support for something like the the public funding that we need to to even salvage what's maybe still decent in these in these contradictory institutions. We are at two hours. Uh, Thank you all for being here. Usually right now we would play the music in the slideshow, but we did have a technical issue during the show. So I'm just gonna thank all of you for being here. I wanna thank again, Boyda. I wanna thank Wendy. I wanna thank Bobby Lee, Ben and John and our Arizona team, the respondents, all of you who are, who are chiming in in the chat box, watching on Facebook, uh, adding to the, on, on, to the uh, conversation. I wanna thank my, my co-producers, Saran and Tim and Linda. Uh, and others who helped to organize today's episode. Uh, Hardball Press is a sponsor. I encourage you all to check out Hardball Press, the working class literature publisher, Hardball Press, Labor Press, uh, Socialism and Democracy, the journal. We're gonna do a special issue on education. I'd love to get some of you to write for that as well as to read it. Uh, and last but not least, Encuentro Cinco, which is an organizing center hub here in downtown Boston, where we are broadcasting from here. Uh, thank you all. So many of you are interested, have indicated interest in getting involved. If you send us an email, you can email me at joe at shelterandsolidarity.org or just jgramsey at gmail.com. I would love to put you on the coordinating committee to organize the next show. Uh, not next week, but in a few weeks, we can plan it. Let's, let's do it collectively. 
maybe we can uh, really contribute to breaking down some of the fragmentation and siloization of working with a working class and higher ed working class in particular and faculty in specific. Let's do it. It's been an inspiration to hear from so many of you today. And I hope you'll tune in next week. We're not talking about higher ed directly, but it's all connected. We'll have Bill Fletcher and others on to talk about the specific intensifying threat to even what's left of uh, our democracy, so-called, in this country. So join us next next week, Thursday at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And I uh, hope to see you then. Uh, the child in your eyes, the strength it took to grow.